Welcome to this training and development presentation from Recreational Aviation Australia where we're looking today at runway loss of control events or RLOX. So what is a runway loss of control event? Basically the ATSB and ICAO define a loss of control as where the pilot is unable to maintain control of the aircraft to effectively arrive at the outcome. In runway or R lock of control events, we're looking at these operations that are affected during the takeoff and landing phase of flight. Let's have a look at some of the outcomes of unfortunate loss of control events and the damage that occurs. This applies to a range of different aircraft types in recreational aviation, not just our three axis aircraft, and the consequences can be grave. So how can we avoid these? What is our aim? So today we're trying to look at how we can educate RAL's pilots about the inherent dangers in operating any RAL's aircraft at slow airspeeds near the ground and provide some strategies to help prevent these events from occurring again. Preventability is the key. We look at a range of uh, data that's provided from the occurrence management system these days and we're able to identify um, common trends. The runway loss of control event is the most significant in incident type in Recreational Aviation Australia's assessments and this has been borne out through uh, worldwide data as well in other countries, uh, particularly with light sport aircraft. So they are preventable but we need to look at how we can effectively manage the aircraft at this low speed environment, both in takeoff and landing, close to the ground where our limited options uh, are available. And think about the conditions as they can affect us close to the ground as well. In about 2012, uh, the Aviation Consumer Magazine in the United States um, ran a report and they looked at uh, the cause of accidents from FAA data. Uh, LSA, uh, as most people are aware, originated in uh, rulings in the United States, and they wanted to have a look at how LSA, which had uh, developed quite radically over the last 10 years, and how the accident statistics were stacking up with light sport aircraft compared to the more conventional general aviation aircraft in the fleet. They uh, chose to have a look at uh, the, the smallest and, and one of the most uh, common training aircraft that's used in the United States in GA and compare it to a range of recreational types. And you can see here they've used the Cessna 152. The LSA uh, accident rate and runway loss of control events clearly shows that uh, as an industry, even outside of LSA, that uh, runway loss of control events are the most significant accident type that we're likely to face as pilots. Uh, in any type of aircraft, but particularly in light sport aircraft. The interesting uh, discovery was the increase in uh, accidents as a percentage compared to general aviation aircraft, even the light 152. And you can see here that 65% of LSA accidents were identified at that time over a seven year rolling study to be uh, with recreational light sport aircraft, compared to about 46% with the reference aircraft like the Cessna 152. So that's a significant difference in our light sport aircraft that they were identified. Now the data is cautioned um, in their report that it's only based on seven years data, but it's probably the most meaningful data that we've got at a worldwide level, certainly with the volume of movements in the states to compare. So basically let's see what makes the light sport aircraft more vulnerable in the landing and takeoff phase of flight and how that it has impacted to create such a difference in, in these potential accidents for us. So firstly we, there's no escaping the fact that we've got lower aircraft weights. Uh, this is one of the benefits of our design, it keeps costs down, it makes the aircraft the overall performance better in many ways. but it also means that the aircraft has lower inertia. And nowhere more important is, is inertia than when we're coming close to the ground. Clearly it's one of the reasons why our, any, our impact at related accidents tend to have less catastrophic effects in many cases where a much heavier aircraft is going to have a much higher impact, uh, impact speed and impact force. So that is an advantage, but it's also a disadvantage when we have to manage that lighter inertia uh, near the ground. Coupled with that, because we've got a lower aircraft weight, Ultimately, we've got to have, we can have lower approach speeds and lower speeds to obtain the lift we need for the aircraft. Lower approach speeds ultimately make us more vulnerable to the surrounding conditions. 
a consequence of the lighter weight is that the aircraft's design is not as robust as some of the heavier systems with more complex uh, undercarriage systems and compact, un not under-engineered, but limited engineering in terms of some of the more structural elements of the non-essential parts for flight, such as the wheels and, and so on. So these trade-offs, as, as it were, mean that our aircraft are more likely to suffer damage as a result of a hard landing or, or a, a runway excursion. And the other thing, of course, is that the freedom to build aircraft using the amateur design process or the amateur building process with RAOs also means that they're not tested and they're not required to be tested to certified standards. So that gives a lot of leeway for some of the designs to actually uh, work on limiting their weight but, but still managing their functionality. The other side effect, of course, is that we generally have uh, higher power output engines compared to the weight so we're pushing engines around 180 to 100 even 140 horsepower in aircraft that weigh less typically less than uh, three to four hundred kilograms so our power to weight ratio is quite good which gives us such great performance but we have to manage that power uh, particularly large to torque forces uh, thrust forces and so on and these become prevalent when we start looking at how power is used to recover from runway loss of control events where it can actually make the situation worse so looking at the outcomes that came from aviation consumer magazines investigation they looked at while I admitted that the numbers were small in the survey, it seemed to confirm what they've said for a long time, that basically light sport aircraft are more difficult to land. So even pilots that have, that have been in the game for a long time, very experienced pilots in heavier inertia aircraft, even they have to adapt their thinking and their skill sets to manage these lower inertia aircraft. Um, and we are more affected. So they came to the same conclusion that, that our accident statistics are clearly showing. So let's have a look, get down to the core and have a look at how these things actually affect us in real life and what we can do with strategies to try and improve and mitigate our risk to these sort of events. Starting off, we basically have to look at the concept that controls react differently at different airspeeds and some controls react differently to others. Now, this was surely covered in your effects of control briefing way back when you first learnt and it's something that we adapt to when we build as we gain experience. But so often in aviation, when we need to investigate and get back to a core issue, we often have to go back to basics. So let's have a look at some of those things and see what's going on. So it's really important to understand that there's a different relationship with airflow as we transition into flight and also in the landing phase between how the elevator and the rudder and then how the ailerons feel. They are all going to have a different feel and also responsiveness at different parts of the flight envelope. We need to understand that, so we need to understand at what point in our, our, our airspeed management do the ailerons start to change? Do you know where your ailerons start to lose effectiveness, at what speed? And how close is that to your normal approach speed? Uh, you need to be familiar with the increased control deflections and how much. One of the things we often see in accident uh, investigations, and even with video footage which you'll see in the accompanying runway loss of control video series, you'll see pilots trying to test or find the control responsiveness because they're really not that sure. And this allows, this often leads to over controlling of the aircraft in the landing phase, and that sets us, sets us up for an unstable approach. So we need to be familiar with the increased control deflections at low air speeds. We also need to know how to use effectively the secondary effect of rudder to take over when the ailerons become ineffective. Now, they're always going to have some effect, but predominantly the rudder is going to maintain the most consistent feel as we start to get through the flare process and into the landing phase. Power can be our friend to create extra airflow over these control surfaces, but it's as we said before, with a high relative power to weight ratio, it can also create a slipstream effect, there can be unwanted torque forces that we have to manage, and of course that uh, obviously the pitching of the aircraft with the changing of power setting, which can affect us as well. We also need to understand not just about the control effectiveness, but get to understand the aircraft we're flying at what point in the airspeed equation does the sink rate substantially change. In some of our modern high performance recreational aircraft, once you get down below 55 to 60 knots, the sink rate actually increases substantially. And this is important that pilot knows where that happens for any particular aircraft. And you only get that with time. A good instructor will point this out to you when he's converting you to the type, but it really you need to understand at what point do you need to 
be more cognizant of the fact that if I get below this speed, my sink rate's gonna be substantially increased. And added to a wind gradient effect, this could be a substantial um, recipe for a poor landing or a runway loss of control event in the landing phase if you don't know where that is. So what's happening outside? So in addition to what we've got to manage with the aircraft as pilots, one of the other things we have to do is we have to, have to be mindful of the environment that we're flying through. A lot of pilots get some basic knowledge of what happens close to the ground, but it's worth revisiting because it's a significant contributor, often over um, analyzed or over blamed, I'd like to say, as the cause for a runway loss of control event. Um, we often see people blaming a gust of wind or a wind gradient that caused me to crash. Well, I'd like to think that we can actually manage ourselves better as pilots and be aware of these and adapt the profile and the performance of the aircraft to recognise the fact that we can have some of these conditions on the land, in the landing and in the takeoff. So firstly, let's look at some principles. Conditions change close to the ground. There's no doubt about that. You need to understand the basics of what changes and how it's going to affect the aircraft. Wind gradient is a real effect. It doesn't always have to be just there on strong wind days. It can, be, it can happen on even light wind days, depending on the surrounding topography, mechanical disturbances and so on. We should be anticipating this in the final approach. The local topography, buildings, vegetation, they all have these direct effects on wind gradient and therefore affect the aircraft's performance profile close to the ground. We talk about currency on type. It's really important if we're going to understand how the control fill of the aircraft is, we're only going to get that through spending time and having that time fairly recent on aircraft types. Uh, fortunately, uh, if you fly a lot of different aircraft types, you'll develop a switch in your head where you know each aircraft handles slightly differently. But be careful, you can sometimes have the primacy of one aircraft overtake you if you get into another aircraft that you're not familiar with. Really good practice is to go and practice at slow speed landing or takeoff configurations at height. So slow the aircraft down, have a look at where the drag equation changes, have a feel where the rudder becomes more effective than the ailerons and look for potential things like uh, initial departures with the wings um, starting to stall and know clearly where that is in your aircraft and um, we don't want to go near there in the landing phase. Understand how to use to your benefit the secondary effect of rudder and then adapt that to your landing approach so that you've got a full composite of control throughout the landing and takeoff phase. All of these things can be done with an instructor if you're not current and an instructor will be able to identify these key issues as you talk through and work through your skill development in these areas. So these are some of the things that can go wrong. Uh, an approach is not often planned or cannot be planned sometimes effectively for conditions and thereby we end up with an unstable approach. So you need to stabilise the approach. If you can't, if it goes wrong, it's okay. Just apply power, adopt the correct climbing attitude, reconfigure the aircraft and go around. Uh, at least then you've had the opportunity to say, hey, I've got a warning for these conditions and I can set up my next approach differently. Clearly what goes wrong is that we see a lack of use of rudder. A lot of people say that, oh, it's just that some pilots don't use rudder, and yet some do. Uh, clearly the rudder is the third axis control, and we need to incorporate it appropriately in the management of the aircraft, particularly in the takeoff and landing phase. We often see, for lack of use of rudder, that the pilot sometimes tries to correct a, 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 an alignment error or over controls with aileron. Uh, this can happen on the base to final turn. It can actually happen on final approach, and you'll see... Um, a shot series we've got of a fox bat in the landing phase where this clearly was uh, uh, clearly is, is what happened and uh, it gives very much um, an understanding of how overuse of ailerons at low airspeed can actually lead to a stalled condition. In the landing roll, and we see this particularly on uh, unimproved strips and places where pilots may be not familiar, is that, or we've had an approach that's overshot the aiming point, that we see the pilot getting onto the brakes fairly early while they're still lifting the wing, causing the aircraft to skid or slide and losing control, basically after the aircraft's landed. And it's important that we need to realise that brakes should only be used as at the last stage of the approach. And when they are used, they should be introduced gradually in through the landing roll, not trying to get pull up short just on brakes. Uh, they're not car brakes, they're not ABS. We just have very limited brakes with limited contact patch. So brakes need to be managed carefully. The other one that does result in a lot of runway loss of control events is bouncing. Uh, and a bounce happens. We occasionally all bounce aeroplanes. Uh, we're, we're all human. 
if we bounce an aircraft. Really good pilots who are really competent and know the aircraft in good conditions can sometimes recover them effectively with power and good management of the aircraft. But the general rule is, if you bounce an aircraft, apply power, reset the appropriate um, sake of safety speed and attitude and go around. There's a reason you bounced it and it probably isn't just to do with the actual flare and bounce, it probably started somewhere back on the approach. So go back, try again. It'll be much better than having your aircraft end up looking like the ones that we just saw in the opening of this presentation. Let's have a look at a typical situation where an aircraft does get into a bounce. And when the aircraft is bounced, we've got a situation where after the aircraft bounces, the pilot might try to recover it. But what tends to happen is his control reactions are out of phase with what's actually happening with the aircraft. When this happens, we end up with this scenario, which is pretty interesting to watch, uh, a little bit horrifying, and at the end of the day, it can result in a lot of damage. Now, I've got to say, I've seen quite a few of these and similar ones to this, and it's horrifying and expensive. There goes your crankshaft, there goes a whole bunch of things, and I think I just see a nose wheel going off in the distance. So, not a happy end to a day when simply a decision to apply power and go around would have created a pitch effect, the pilot managed that, we climb out and we go around and, uh, and try again. Generally, uh, it happens as a result of too fast an approach or getting behind the aircraft once we've not made a correct decision to, to abort the approach and go around. So again, we see those points mentioned here, an aircraft not slowed to its lowest safe speed in the flare, that we're trying to land the aircraft rather than uh, waiting for the aircraft to land when it's ready. Here, pilot, clearly the pilot got behind the aircraft in decisions and actions, both in the pilot-induced oscillation, but probably way back on the approach as well. And then sometimes we can have a look and see that the landing surface is unsuitable or been incorrectly assessed. A lot of RAO's operations occur on grass runways. Uh, some are on unimproved landing areas rather than authorised landing areas or registered aerodromes. And sometimes uh, we might find that we use uh, the grass runway rather than the bitumen for, for, for purposes, particularly tail dragger pilots tend to do that. But it's important to know where the hard surfaces uh, can only be used and know what the condition of those, those uh, uh, gable areas are or these areas outside the normal landing strip. The other one we see, and this is referenced in our training, accompanying training video, is that pilots often try to take off in the aircraft before it's ready. Sometimes they'll do this because they've got obstacle limitations at the upwind end, or simply because they're trying to force the aircraft into the air, maybe just to show off that they're good at short field takeoffs. In any case, when we try to put the aircraft in the air before it's ready, we have got limited control in all three axes, but particularly in the roll axis with ailerons. So let's have a look at some examples in flight. Here's the, uh, the slide sequence we're talking about before. We've got an aircraft that's come in. Clearly we've had a wing drop, as might be explained by the pilot. Most likely it could be because of the approach speed or it could be related to turbulence, but the pilot's overuse of aileron has effectively stalled the downward wing and the aircraft has not been able to recover and the rest of it you can see. Expensive, hey? So let's have a look at some examples in flight. Here we've got a young pilot approaching on a bitumen runway. You'll notice the aircraft yawing and there's quite a bit of aileron movement being deflected. This is in a Jabiru with fairly small ailerons, effective at high speed and normal cruise, but start to become limited. You'll see that he touched down slightly to the left of centerline and was yawing left. He's applied right rudder, overcorrected on a very grippy bitumen runway. He's now got himself into a runway loss of control event. Fortunately, in that case, he recovered it, applied throttle and got out of there. Here's the very next approach. Again, we've got the aircraft yawing left. It's not being managed with good directional control. Left hand nose wheel. He's put the nose wheel down and because all the force at that time was pointing us to the left, there was a slight crosswind to the right, but reports were it was only minor and the aircraft run off the side of the runway. In that case, potentially, there was a lot of damage could have happened, but the aircraft got away unscathed. But a really important lesson for that young pilot. So some golden rules. Let's have a look. When we set our approach speed, it should be varied as the conditions dictate. A general rule of thumb is that we apply best glide or normal approach speed as per the manufacturer's operating handbook, plus one third the wind speed. And so for less than 10 knots, that's probably not critical. But once we get over 10 knots of identified wind, it's good to apply that rule. The next one is rudder controls runway alignment. 
It's no good trying to chase the aircraft down the runway with ailerons only because we'll end up in a delayed, adverse yaw, rolling situation where we're in an uncontrolled approach. Ailerons are very helpful to help us control slip and can be used effectively with the interwind wing to manage a crosswind component. Use of the rudder and the ailerons effectively, but not over relying on the ailerons, will allow us to have a stabilised approach. And remember, it's important when we do line up to, to, to flare that the aircraft wheels are pointing in the same direction as the movement of the aircraft. Otherwise, we're going to land crabbed and that's going to result in uh, potential damage when we land. Another rule is expect the conditions to change. They'll change between circuits and they'll certainly change between airfields and they're likely to change every time between when you're flying at circuit height and when you're coming over the fence. So be aware and be un understand the, th the conditions and the obstacles that are likely to cause the sort of things like mechanical turbulence and wind gradient. And work your approach out and plan it based on these threats. So know what speed to approach. Decide whether to use flaps or not use flaps based on the conditions that you're going to have to encounter. And then think about the consequences of the configuration and how you approach. Some further one. We've said this a few times. I can't say it enough. Professional pilots go around when any doubt exists. It's no embarrassment. The best pilots will make the decision to go around. Uh, we've all done it and, and um, sometimes it, <laughs> you think everyone's watching, but you know what, nobody ever talks and, and derogatively about someone who went around, but they certainly will be talking for weeks and years sometimes about the aircraft that lost it on landing. Next thing, understand your aircraft. We talked about this again before, so we're recapping here. Understand how it handles and understands particularly how that handling changes at different airspeeds. Same old story, you'll never hear this different. Practice, practice, practice. But not just in good conditions. Go out and practice in a variety of conditions. Take small chunks initially as you're learning, but if you're not confident in an area, get an experienced instructor who can help you with your flying. Go out and practice crosswind landings. Go out and use the other runway occasionally and get to understand the different handling techniques that can make you feel confident when you're actually out in conditions that are less than suitable. So we've talked a lot in the presentation here about nose wheel three axis aircraft. So what if it's not my type? Look, we haven't covered in this presentation today the detail that relates to uh, a whole bunch of different aircraft that are in recreational use. Obviously we haven't covered trikes, we haven't covered uh, powered parachutes, and we haven't talked specifically about tailwheel aircraft which require specialist techniques in both takeoff and landing. Obviously, these aircraft will require different endorsements or um, design feature types, so you'll be taught how to handle these aircraft. Two-axis aircraft definitely have limitations that a good instructor, when you go uh, fly these aircraft, will teach you how to manage them in all the conditions. But many of the control principles we're talking about here can be applied no matter what type of aircraft you fly. The interesting thing is that even with tailwheel aircraft, which would traditionally require a, a greater degree of skill to handle, we don't see that many tailwheel loss of control accidents in our organisation. Most of them are nose wheel. Now, I know that's proportionate to hours flown, but interestingly, our tailwheel trained pilots are taught from the start how important to manage the aircraft in all three axes, particularly with use of rudder. So maybe there's some lessons we can learn, and if there's an opportunity, go and do a tailwheel endorsement. It actually might make you a better nose wheel pilot. So all these things uh, are pertinent to different aircraft types. Obviously, there are specialist areas that you need to train in. Uh, the object of today's presentation is not to cover everything, but to at least give you some fundamentals that you should be able to apply no matter what type of aircraft you fly. Finally, I want to thank you very much for listening to this presentation. This is the first of many. We hope that you're able to gain some helpful hints from this and improve your flying. And remember, uh, we're here for serious fun, but we need to take our flying seriously, and part of that is our own learning and development. Thanks very much for watching this training development series from Recreational Aviation Australia. Bye.